trail and ultra runners what is going on what's happening welcome to another episode of the coop cast as always i am your humble host coach jason coop and this episode of the podcast is with the renowned professor david bishop Professor Bishop is a world leader in muscle exercise physiology with more than 250 scientific publications to his name. He leads the Skeletal Muscle and Training Research Group at Victoria University in Australia. And the focus of that research group is to examine how diet, exercise, and genes interact to regulate skeletal muscle adaptations. I'm excited to bring Professor Bishop on the podcast today because he has had a tremendous impact in the landscape as we know it. He has held many different and important positions within the exercise science community in Australia. He was the youngest ever president of Exercise and Sports Science Australia. He has been named as one of the top 25 influencers of exercise and sports sciences in Australia. He has twice been on the Excellence in Research Australia panel, and he was made a fellow of three different organizations, Exercise in Sports Science Australia, the American College of Sports Medicine, and the European College of Sports Science. Professor Bishop is now a director of the Victorian Institute of Sport, as well as an assistant editor of Medicine and Science in Sport and Exercise. And in this conversation, we discuss the mitochondria's role in exercise performance. We discuss how the mitochondria develop differently at different ranges of intensities, which is of supreme interest today given the current zone two training craze. We also discuss how we might be able to amplify improvements using dietary interventions as well as supplements. And what I have come to appreciate the most about David's approach is how he recognizes how the minutia of things like signaling pathways and other phenomena that he investigates are both important and limiting with respect to how they might impact end performance. Okay, with that as an extensive but well-deserved background, I'm here to present to you today my conversation with David Bishop. I am very much looking forward to this, David. Um, I think that, um, uh, I, well, I don't want to speak for you, but you probably, your your knowledge set has probably come back into high demand recently, since there's been a lot of emphasis on mitochondrial development and function. And um, whenever I've talked with, uh, whenever I've had guests on previously, that their area of expertise has kind of come back into vogue. They always get like really excited. Like I remember during the COVID era when all the exercise immunologists, people with that domain expertise, they never get to kind of like show off what they know until there's there's a global pandemic and everybody wants their services. I kind of feel like you're in the same uh, you're in the same boat right now. But to give the listeners a little bit of context of what I'm talking about, can you just go over your areas of interest in, in, in research that you've been focusing on o- over the course of your career? Yeah, it, it's been interesting because I've first, thanks, Jason. Thanks for the invite to, to be on the, on the podcast. It's interesting, you know, getting a little bit older now. So I've sort of been reflecting a little bit of it and, um, and sometimes it seemed at haphazard, but looking back, maybe there was a plan all along. So, you know, from my, you know, younger days, and then also when I was doing my PhD, I've been interested in exercise prescription. I think that's fundamentally like, how do we, what's the best way to prescribe exercise to, to get the benefits out of, you know, for performance. And also increasingly, I'm interested in, in health as well. And so, yeah, my PhD was actually more on resistance training and endurance performance. From there, we were looking at, um, Then I started working with team sport athletes and so I'd worked with a lot of sort of repeated sprint ability and things like that. And maybe leading into this discussion, we got started to look at supplements and different types of ways to improve performance, but also improve adaptations to training. And we did some, we did some really interesting work, I think probably 15, 20 years ago now using sodium bicarbonate and we used it not as in its probably traditional sense, but as a, I guess, a, as, a, as a supplement to try and alongside training. So it wasn't for an acute 
one-off event, but during an eight-week training period. And we saw some really, um, I guess, surprising benefits in terms of endurance adaptations. And we kind of got thinking to what that might be, and this is sort of a long-winded answer, but we sort of settled on the mitochondria might be the might be the the role there. I had an opportunity to go to France and work in a a lab that specialised in mitochondrial functional measurements. And I guess from there, you know, really got interested in the mitochondria. It's a you know, pretty cool organism, obviously, when you think of it as a, the powerhouses of the cell having a really critical role. And it's a, it's a nice little nexus, I think, between you need energy for performance, but mitochondria also have a, a really important role in health. So it kind of became a nice focal point to be able to look both at my, you know, deep interest in endurance, you know, athletic performance, but also an increasing interest in health. And I think the way that the conversation for this particular podcast is going to go, we're going to reverse engineer that because we're going to start at the mitochondria and then probably go to the supplement uh, side of things. As a quick programming note, I'll direct the listeners to a previous podcast that I did with Inigo San Milan on uh, mitochondria as well. That's a great resource for anybody who's going to be more interested uh, in, in in this topic. So mitochondrial development has, it's kind of come back into vogue with the recent zone two craze. And I almost, actually I have them right here. I'll show it to you, David. The people who are watching the YouTube uh, video of this will get a kick out of it. I didn't plan this. That's why the... Uh, that's, that's the break right there. But I had these shirts made for some of our coaching staff to remind them that, in, in fact, all zones do matter. We <laughs> support all training zones, not just zone two. And we had to make this just because of the over infatuation with this particular training, with this particular training activity, and its inevitable tie to mitochondrial development. But let's take a little bit of a step back. We, we have kind of colloquialized mitochondria's importance as just what you said. It's the powerhouse of the cell. But in reality, it's, it, can be, it can be described as a little bit more complex than that. What, how would you describe the mitochondria's function, not only within exercise, but also in, within health? Yeah, I think it's a really good one. And there's uh, it's probably a little, it might be, I don't know if it's too academic for some of your listeners, but yeah, Martin Picard, who's uh, a uh, originally Canadian researcher, but he's based in America now, did a did a nice paper just talking about, I guess, the terminology. And when, um, I don't want to go too down to the rabbit hole, but sometimes a mitochondrial function can be like a bit of a catch-all phrase, like you say, oh, someone will say, well, you know, what's my best, you know, best training to improve mitochondrial function? And it's kind of like saying, you know, what's the best training to improve muscle function? Yeah. And you kind of go, okay, yeah, what, what actual function are you talking about? And as you, I think you alluded to nicely there, mitochondria have got lots of functions. They've probably, they're most famously, and you see this everywhere, you know, the powerhouse of the cells. And yeah, they supply more than 95% of the energy. So, yeah, when you're sleeping, walking, running, that's where your energy is ultimately coming from. So that's that's their key function. But they seem to have important roles in cell signaling. They've obviously in also, you know, ROS production and also combating ROS production. They've also seem to have important roles in um, um, program cell death. So as your as your cells are getting older and they need to be recycled, that in you know, producing the energy, not only for, for function, as in like the outward function, like running, cycling or whatever, but also all the other function, all the other energy producing um, functions that are going on, you know, building new cells, breaking down new cells. So yeah, they're, they're a critical or, uh, organelle that have more than just energy producing functions. And kind of related to the zone, cra this is the zone two craze that I was mentioning earlier, from a from an in, from an endurance standpoint, we've typically divided mitochondrial development into kind of two different pathways, right? Building more of them or building a greater mass of them, 
and then improving their function. I was going to say efficiency, but that's not going to be the right that you'll probably slap my wrist for using that, <laughs> that type of terminology. Is that the way that we should be looking at it from endurance athletes is down these two different pathways. And if that, if that is the case, fundamentally, what types of training activities would facilitate those two different types of adaptations? Yeah, and I think you're spot on. So, and without sort of complicating things, I'd maybe just add a third one in there. So I think you've got how, how much mitochondria, so your mitochondrial mass inside the muscle is probably a, a key development. One is also going to be, I guess, the, the morphology of the mitochondria. So things just to do with shape and connectedness and also crystal density. And those, yeah, if we've got some young researchers listening, they're really ripe for study because there's very little research on that. So I don't think we'll really talk about that today. And then the third one is actually is exactly like you said, and is the, I guess, the ability of mitochondria to take substrates, use it and combined with oxygen to produce the ATP that we need to to do everything that we need to do. And part of this mitochondrial, like we'll, we'll just use the term development. One of the questions that a lot of coaches have that there's been an extensive amount of research on is, is it site specific? Meaning, can we use one training mode to develop mitochondria that might have an effect in another training mode, arms versus legs or cycling versus running? And I think that this has a critical impact for coaches that are using a lot of like cross training modalities and things like that in order, in order to train their athletes for whatever reason, what do we know about that site specificity of mitochondrial development? Yeah. I'm just trying to stretch my memory, whether anyone's exactly looked at mitochondria, but I think you know, what I always say to people is that, you know, you've only got one heart so that if you're running, cycling, swimming, rowing or whatever, you're going to be challenging your heart. So you will get, you'll get central benefits from any sort of exercise. With, uh, with the mitochondria, I'd expect, yeah, in, maybe yeah, in some ways the same analogy, you're using the heart for whatever you do. And so you're gonna get adaptations, whatever you do. But with the muscle, you really need to be using the muscle to, to get, I'd say, significant benefits. So. There have been studies where, like I said, I don't think, I'm not sure specifically with the muscle, but where you train leg and measure what's happening in the arm. And you see very little change in things like the lactate threshold, which I would expect to, to relate strongly to the, to, the, to the mitochondrial adaptation. So my expectation would be that you, that would be quite, muscle specific in that you need to be able to stress the muscle to get those adaptations. Having said that, there is some evidence, and we've seen it, it's difficult to do this in, in humans, but other organs responding to um, exercise. So we haven't published this, but I think we did some really cool, this was in a rodent study where you get them running on a treadmill and doing their endurance training. And we saw improvements in the mitochondrial respiration. So the, the ability to take ADP and, and produce ADP in the kidneys and other organs inside the, the muscle, uh, inside the, in the body. So I think, I suspect that's probably something to do with um, blood flow, but with organs, you know, contracting your muscles and doing exercise does seem to have beneficial effect on other organs. But in terms of the muscles, I'd expect very little carryover from you know, running to, to arm muscles, for example. And I think the, the, the take home message here for the athletes and the coaches that are programming training for athletes is that there's a large degree of, of specificity within the movement itself. And we talk in trail running a lot about even hiking versus running, right? Those are two kind of completely different movements that stress to, you know, that stress different, that stress the muscles differently. I'll, I'll kind of like phrase it like that. And that could have implications for some of the developments that are going on at the cellular level and some of the mitochondrial developments that are going on. Um, I want to talk about something, or I want to move to something that is endurance athletes' favorite topics, and that's volume. 
because part of mitochondrial development is simply dictated by high volumes at low intensities. And I remember reading a paper that you uh, were a co-author on and postulating that there seems to even be no ceiling. There seems to be either, there seems to be no upper limit to mitochondrial mass improvements with increases in volume. And I wanted you to describe that a little bit in terms of, can we get more specific on what the intensity of this low intensity volume needs to be and how, how is it real or is it a linear relationship between volume and mitochondrial adaptation? Yeah. And stop me if I go too long here, because there's probably a couple of um, things that kind of base knowledge that we need to, to go through. The first one, and <laughs> this could be a podcast in itself, is just the whole intensity conundrum. Yeah. Because when you go through and there's low, moderate, high, and different, you know, different papers will have moderate intensity, but it's if you look closely, the intensity is actually low intensity in another paper. And then as you said that, you know, you got zone one, two, three, and then you got zone one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So what um if I would um simplistically I would um I try and base it a little bit more on physiology. So what I would say is if you think about the two commonly accepted metabolic thresholds. So I'll use lactate because that's what I'm most familiar with. But if you have runners, if they're doing an incremental test, so starting off at a low speed and gradually increasing the speed, the lactate will stay pretty stable for a while for the first few speeds. So it won't increase if we measure it in the blood. Then we'll come to the first metabolic threshold where there's a slight tick up in the lactate in the blood, keep increasing the intensity, and then you'll get a more rapid increase in the lactate level. And there's changes in ventilation and other things going on there. So I would put low intensity as below the first metabolic threshold, moderate intensity as between those two metabolic thresholds and then high intensity from above the second metabolic threshold to, I guess, the sort of VO2 max intensity. And I said, that's just so that we can be on the same page when we're, when we're, we're trying to ke- compare intensities. And the listeners um, of this, the longtime listeners of this podcast will recognize that we are on the same page. We, we did a podcast with our lab manager, Renee Eastman, you described the zones kind of exactly as you had described them. So everything is everything is uh, uh, everything is running in parallel here. Okay, that's great to know. Um, in terms of um, vo- and I guess there hasn't and when we look at so in terms of mitochondrial mass, one of the I guess the difficulties with the field is that um, it's mostly measured indirectly. So you'll see a lot of studies, including ours, that have measured this this one enzyme called citrate synthase and used that as a marker of mitochondrial mass. And I think that I think the jury is prop we need a little bit more evidence to so I just add that caveat because most studies are talking about, and including ours, when we talk about mitochondrial volume and um, mitochondrial mass and training volume are using an indirect marker of mitochondrial mass. There's been maybe half a dozen studies that have directly measured mitochondrial or more directly measured mitochondrial mass with actual imaging. And to your to your previous point, it looks like and we need it looks like this probably starts to get a plateau at a certain point. So I think when we in the paper, I think that you mentioned when we've graphed it, you see this linear increase. And the last there's only one or two data points at the end, but it looks like maybe it's starting to, to plateau. So in terms of, you know, if I want to give a kilometers per week or you know something like that, I, I don't have that number for you. But I suspect there is a there is going to be an, an upper limit and, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't know what that is, but I think there probably is an upper limit to the exercise volume. What would potentially be the biochemical or the physiological governor 
for those improvements. That's what I've always, that's what I've always wondered. Whenever there's a ceiling for something, we always talk about the rate limiting step or the rate limiting factor in any sort of physiological process, or we're talking about VO2 max or whatever. And I've always, it's always been curious to me within mitochondrial development, what is, what is actually limiting the total amount that it, that the body can synthesize? Great question. I think it's probably, I think it's probably two things. One is that um, yeah, your body is supremely good at maintaining homeostasis. And so, and we've seen this with our studies and I think everyone knows this as well, is that the first time you do exercise, it's quite, yeah, it's going to be quite stressful. And then all of the adaptations that you get from training, the the ultimate goal is to make the next exercise session less stressful, but that stress is what's driving the adaptations. And so over time, I think, you know, and we see that, I think that's a large reason why athletes plateau. And it's also why I'm really interested in this prescription idea is it, it's just almost like a self-limiting thing is that you get the stress, you adapt so it's less stressful. And so next time you do that exercise session, and you know this has been repeated over weeks, months, and years, it's less stressful. So that's gonna drive a smaller adaptation. And then you're gonna adapt and it's gonna get less stressful again. So I think you know, in some ways that's the, you know, the heart and the, the, you know, the million billion dollar question is how do you maintain, how do we best prescribe exercise to keep that stress as, um, as high as possible to continue to get the adaptations. And I think the second part of it is as well, if you look at the, the mitochondria in you know, untrained people, the mitochondria might be two or 3% of your muscle. That's the, the, the mass that it takes up and can probably get that to eight to 10%. But, you know, there's lots of other things in your muscle other than mitochondria. So, you know, you would never get there, but you could never be like 100% mitochondria because <laughs> then, you'd, right. you you know, you're kicking out every, it's like, um, I don't know, if you, if you had a car and you made it 100% engine, cool, it might go fast, but, you know, you haven't got room for all the other things that, that you need for, to, for, the, for the car to work. So I think there's also a... Um, it's almost probably like a phys and some there have been some papers that have suggested in that there's some there's, al there's almost like a space limitation yeah. to to how much mitochondria you can actually jam into a skeletal muscle yeah that, and that's what i've always wondered is this spatial limitation the thing that is actually limiting the this ultimate ceiling that we could get to because the muscle can only get so big and then that, that four limits the space and you can only jam so much stuff into it like a room or your car car analogy or whatever else it is yeah, exactly. Um, I, I want to get your take on a on a prescriptive element of this, because if we know that there's a linear or relatively a linear relationship between volume and mitochondrial development, is there any way that we can manipulate volume to enhance that development? And the the, the kind of the main way that we look at doing this from a practitioner's point of view is just through the duration of the session. I can do one two-hour sessions, or I can do one two-hour session, or I can do two one-hour sessions. When we start to manipulate volume that way, do you actually see any differences in mitochondrial biogenesis? Yeah, another good question. And maybe that's where we kind of need like a little, a quick breakout as well. So when we talk about um, exercise volume, I guess I probably we're using it in terms of a bit like risk, I guess, in a resistant training concept. So not so much time, but total amount of exercise. So like you in, in that analogy, if you ran, whatever, 10 kilometers an hour for four hours or 20 kilometers an hour for two hours, that would basically be the same exercise volume. So, it's not not it's not just it, duration is not the i guess the the only thing of volume so i guess kind of the analogy it like to is, work right you could normalize it to work it's basically work yeah 
Yeah, exactly. And that's what we do when, when we do, we do a lot of our studies on this cycle ergometer, so we can actually measure the work and, and we'll match it in terms of external work. So I think there's two things there. I think that there's, I think that it's not just a volume. I think that there's probably, I think there's probably, there's also an intensity component. And what I mean by that is that, like, I think if you walked for six hours at six Ks an hour, that wouldn't be the same as running for at 12 Ks an hour for three hours. So I think there's a, I think there's, there's, there's probably almost, I don't know what the best terminology is here, an intensity hurdle yeah. that you need to, to pass before the, the volume becomes the, the critical factor. And we've, we've, we haven't published this, but we just did a study where we had people training for 90 to 120 minutes, four times a week, just below their first metabolic threshold. So the, the upper end of zone one. And we saw some, we saw some changes in mitochondrial mass, but they probably weren't as high as what I've expected. And I think that, and uh, this is where I'm sort of going a little bit out on, on a limb, but I think probably getting above that first metabolic threshold is an important intensity where, where the, where the role of volume becomes um, more critical. Um, and then back to your other point. So, you know, we've done a lot of, um, lot of our early studies with high intensity interval training and what high intensity interval training allows you to do is to, to get quite a large volume of work. So if you multiply the intensity by the, the, the duration, you can get a, a very high um, total amount of work done. And um, we've, we've seen that to be very effective for increasing mitochondrial mass as well. So to your first point, there seems to be like a minimum viable product, so to speak, where the intensity can be too, too easy and it's not enough of a trigger or the alter, the alternative conspiracy theory is, is you would just have, you would just have to have such a large volume at that very low intensity that it becomes impractical, right? Just from a, mm. I can't train for 20 hours a day type of, uh, type of perspective, which is always really interesting because as ultra marathon athletes are listening to this, they're always wondering, when is it too easy? Like, when are my workouts too easy? Whenever, whenever I spent too long in the mountains on a training activity to where the, where the work becomes un, e either not productive or, or unproductive, right? Either like it, it, it detracts from any sort of future sessions that you can do. And there does seem to be a minimum viable proposition that keeps pro that keeps kind of like crop cropping up in different people's work. And I'll bring up uh, an interview I did with Steven Seiler and the, uh, in the hmm. show notes where we talked a little bit about that minimum intensity viable proposition that, um, uh, that, that he's been exploring. I want to move I think to just to, sorry, can I just add one thing yeah. there? I was just going to yeah. say that, um, I think the other thing I've sort of been thinking about when I have these discussions with people is that, you know, we're talking about mitochondria and yeah, as much as I want to think that mitochondria are the be all and <laughs> the only thing that, you know, that matters <laughs> is that, you know, it may be that, you know, for argument's sake, you know, maybe a four hour run at a really low intensity is important to increase blood volume or some, some central adapt, some other capillarization or some, some central adaptation. So I think that, yeah, I think that's one of the, I don't know about dangers, but one of the cautions is that I'm talking specifically about, you know, mitochondrial adaptations and there, there could be training that maybe isn't optimal for the mitochondria may be really important for, for, a, um, for some other parallel adaptations that are, that are critical for, for um, ultra endurance performance. Yep. That's a, that's a very important caveat to add is sometimes we tend to get too nuanced in the adaptations that we want and not realizing or for failing to realize that performance is always multifactorial. You're going to have a multitude of physiological and psychological and even uh, environmental factors that come into play when you're determining the ultimate outcome of whatever, whatever, whatever performance yeah. outcomes we're looking at. And I think, it, yeah, maybe a good example is also, you know, this isn't my field, but yeah, there's some interesting research, you know, about 
resistance training and plyometric training, improving running economy and things like that. And whereas, yeah, those sorts of trainings, I'd argue, have almost no effect on the on the mitochondria, but they are having positive effects on on endurance performance. Yeah, that's a great analogy, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Brilliant. Um, okay, so let's move to the other side of the intensity uh, spectrum. We talked about the fact that there might be a minimum viable intensity that you need to eclipse in order for some of these adaptations to kick in. What do we know about the improving mitochondrial function? And you can use a different term if you want to, if you if you if you choose to, because I know that it's been dis discussed in the literature in kind of various contexts. But what what do we know about those specific types of adaptations and the intensity and the volume of intensity? that could potentially elicit an improvement in the function of the mitochondria that you actually have. Yeah. And I think, I think it's good functions, great for shorthand. And I think what, I, what we would, in this case, what we're talking about, I guess, is um, respiratory function. So the, the ability of the mitochondria to take substrates and use oxygen to, to produce, um, to produce energy. And so that's what we, we often measure in our lab. It's really interesting. And I think if I was going to, and you know, these things sometimes become sort of dichotomous and it's not exactly the, the case, but with uh, quite low intensity, high volume, we see increases in mitochondrial mass. And these increases in mitochondrial mass can sometimes, you know, in terms like of a percentage change, will exceed the changes in mitochondrial function. When we get a little bit more in the middle, we kind of see it proportional. So you might get a 40% improvement in mitochondrial mass and you get a 40% improvement in mitochondrial function. So that's kind of in the, 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 the middle there. And then as you alluded to, with the really high intensity, so we're talking um, sprint interval training, so these is the, what we've used, I guess, is the classic Wingate type stuff where it's 30 seconds all out, four minutes break, rest and go again, you know, really hard training. And then what we see there is the improvements in mitochondrial function exceed the improvements in mitochondrial mass. And we don't, <laughs> that's, I guess, another, what's a really, we're really, really interested in my lab is exactly what's, what's driving that. But what we've what we've seen and i guess this relates a little bit to our previous discussion and what we think is you know exercise is a stress but what we've seen is that this really really high intensity exercise um is a a, a really a, a more intense mitochondrial stress and we think that this greater mitochondrial stress is driving this proportionally greater increase in in respiratory function and this is i guess what we'll explore in the next um, in our next research but like all of the uh proteins and structures in our body they're continually being built built up and broken down so your mitochondria have a life cycle depending on where it is of you know from a few years to quite a few years and so the mitochondria constantly being getting bigger and then if they get damaged or maybe not functioning as well they'll be targeted to be broken down and they'll be, their little their bits will be recycled and you know you keep going through this process where i think in skeletal muscle you know probably every 15 years all of your mitochondria have mm -hmm. have been replaced and what we think is that the and this is just our hypothesis is that the really intense sprint interval training, we think it's maybe speeding up this breakdown process. So when you've got mitochondria that's coming towards the end of the end of its life, we think that the, um, the sprint interval training might be speeding it up to actually be broken down and replaced by better, better functioning mitochondria. And so we think that's why with sprint interval training, we get not much of an increase in the amount of mitochondria. We do see small increases, but a much greater increase in function because we think you're getting a yeah a slight increase in the pool. But the main adaptation is that you've got better 
better functioning mitochondria that are better able to use substrates and oxygen to produce energy. So it's literally facilitating the out with the old and with the new process. I love it. That, I'll have to use that in my talks. Yeah, I think that's what it's. <laughs> yeah, that's I think I mean, we haven't actually shown that, but that's just just our hypothesis. What we have shown is that when we've compared moderate and sprint interval exercise, moderate intensity and sprint interval training, there's a, a much greater increase in mitochondrial stress. We also see um, if you look at, you know, if you imagine like I think most people are sort of familiar with mitochondria. Immediately after moderate intensity training, you see these beautiful bean shaped, you know, pictures, they look super healthy. After sprint interval training, we actually see some mitochondria that look like they're damaged and some of them have got missing cristae and I think they've started to be broken down. So it's not just a wild hypothesis. We have yeah. seen we have seen evidence of much greater mitochondrial damage and mitochondrial damage response with sprint interval training. And sometimes when I've given this talk at, um, to other scientific meetings and people get like freaked out about, I know mitochondrial being damaged, maybe we shouldn't do sprint interval training. Yeah. But I think you know, the analogy I give is, you know, with resistance training, exactly the same thing happens. Like you get muscle fiber damage and that's part of the stress response, which promotes a, a rebuilding of skeletal muscle. And so I actually think, you know, this mitochondrial damage is probably a, a good thing, which starts to start this, like I said, out with the old, in with the new mitochondrial process. Well, and it also has a tie into your the space theory that we were discussing earlier, where there's only a, there's a limited amount of space within the muscle fibers itself for the mitochondria to exist. And if you're replacing what I'll call poor, poor functioning ones, or if you're getting rid of poor functioning ones, it literally frees up space for the newer model, right? The newer model can kind of come in, function better and provide, you know, more, more ATP for the muscle. Yeah, I think you always have to be careful because I think you know, biology doesn't always make sense <laughs> and isn't always logical. <laughs> yeah, but that, that does make a lot of sense to at least to me that, you know, the idea that you use this process to, yeah, to fill up that limited space with the, with the best quality mitochondria that you can. I love, I love the fact that you, and I'm going to, I'm going to put words in your mouth that I don't think, I, don't, I think you mind, you'll mind me doing, you kind of described intensity and mitochondrial development that goes underneath the intensity on a continuum, as opposed to these very distinct, discrete breaks that we often try to categorize intensity and then whatever physiological development is associated with that intensity with. And you went through this continuum of low, medium, high. This is what happens at low. We're getting, you know, a lot of improvements in mass. This is what happens at medium. It's kind of a mixture of both mass and function. And this is what happens at high. It's a little bit of mass and a whole and a whole lot of function. But in reality, that graph is continuous, right? There aren't kind of like break, there aren't really uh, uh, breaks in it. And I think that that's important for athletes and coaches to remember in the endless amount of training zone quantification debates. You mentioned that, you know, you see seven zone systems. I've seen 12 and 20 zone systems in my, you know, in my uh, coaching career. And I'm always wondering why, why do we really need to delineate things that granularly? Is there something that is specifically happening across each and every one of those? And I think the more and more practice that I have, it, it makes me appreciate more of this continuum uh, uh, strategy that every intensity has some sort of continuum of uh, physiological benefits that we can associate it with. Yeah. And I really like the, um, and I think I've seen Steven Seeler present this in a different way, but I guess, you know, everyone's familiar with the nutrition pyramid and yeah, there's not too many people who would say just eat, you know, this one type of food, you know, that's generally you need, you know, you need carbohydrates, protein, fats, and you know, the different vitamins and minerals, but you need the, you need the range of um, foods. And, and I think it's the same with exercise. And I guess specifically with, with mitochondria, I think that the, um, yeah, and sometimes it's a bit simplistic, you know, the classic, you know, moder moderation and everything, and it's probably not quite moderation and everything, but I think 
hitting those different intensity zones and different volume um, types of volume will give you different mitochondrial adaptations. And I think if you just did one type of training, it's probably not going to be optimal for, for your mitochondrial adaptations. 100%. That's a brilliant take home message. And a good segue, we can wrap up with that take home message and a good segue to the next part of your uh, academic career and professional career that we're going to reverse engineer. And that's taking the training that you're doing and having it mean more. That's the way that I like to describe it. You, We all have 10 hours per week and within those 10 hours per week or whatever it is, we can do any number of different things, but literally taking the work that you're doing and the work that you are going to do and having an enhanced response to it via some mechanism, training low, taking a nutrition intervention, and there's a oh, there's kind of a whole host of others. I want to tackle the, the the training low piece first because we might run out of time here, and I think it's the most important from from an, from an ultra marathons ultra marathoners perspective. Um, it's a strategy that a lot of athletes will specifically take on to promote greater rates of fat oxidation. It's a really, and I'm not going to profess to to for that to be the best way but it is a common way that a lot of uh, that a lot of athletes or it's a common thing that a lot of athletes do to try to achieve that that specific adaptation but when we kind of work into the reality of it there's a lot of caveats that we have to work through first off to to kind of set the table a little bit can we get superior training adaptations specifically from training with low carbohydrate av availability. And then we can move into, if that is the case, how would we actually set those sessions up? Yeah, we've been looking, and I think this is, um, yeah, lots of people are interested in it. <laughs> and the, the, one of the tricky things I think is that um, there's so many variables that are at play. So when you look through the, the literature, you know, what exactly train low means can be, you know, you've got whether it's a sleep low type protocol. So you do some sort of glycogen depletion exercise in the afternoon or evening and don't, don't have carbohydrates uh, during the night. Then do you come in and have breakfast or not have breakfast before you do your training session? And then is your training session a moderate intensity or a, or a high intensity? And so I think I can, under, I can understand with, you know, people looking at the literature, it's really, it can be a little bit difficult to decipher. And I think the other thing to say there is that most of the studies have really looked at, um, I guess, cell signaling responses. There's not many studies that have actually done like a training, like where you train for four or six, eight weeks or longer using a different um, train, you know, some sort of a train low protocol. So we're, we're really relying on these acute changes. Typically people are measuring, you know, increases in genes like, you know, PGC1 alpha, which is uh, the, the master regulator of, of mitochondrial biogenesis and trying to extrapolate those changes to whole body adaptations and then ultimately to per performance. So, but having said that, I'd say there's pretty, I think pretty solid evidence that the train, train low, especially if you come in and don't, and have either a low carbohydrate or no carbohydrate breakfast before you do your moderate intensity training session, that that can increase um, cell signaling that's associated with fat oxidation and mitochondrial biogenesis and, and you know, other adaptations important for endurance performance. I think the evidence for doing a train low with a high intensity exercise session is probably more equivocal. I think there's probably two reasons for that. One is it's really hard to do high intensity yeah. training <laughs> if you don't have carbohydrates. And so, and I think, you know, John Holy's shown this um, nicely that you just can't, you know, you can't, you can't do if you're doing intervals or whatever it might be, you can't do that at the same intensity if, um, 
if you're in a train low condition. So the workout itself is compromised and that potentially offsets any sort of other response that you're getting is what you're getting at there. Yeah. And I think when, um, I think when I think John, I can't remember the exact numbers, but um, he was saying that I think his study showed like they could only get to about 85% of the target intensity yeah. when they were, when they were, uh, train low and i and think that's the a other big thing miss by the way like the, let me let's just put that in context yeah, yeah. right you're running six minute pace and all of a sudden you're running what is that going to be seven minute pace or something like that like that's not a trivial miss on the intensity side whenever i whenever i look at things like that no no exactly and i think the other thing is that and i think maybe it relates to our previous discussion but yeah there's probably you'd expect there's some sort of ceiling to how how much you can activate the muscle with an exercise session. And so I think what happens with, uh, you know, with a moderate intensity is you're getting a moderate activation of your cell signaling and you can augment that by training low. If you're doing a high intensity training session, you're probably already getting quite a, a large activation of your cell signaling. And so there's, there's, I don't think there's much room to, 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 to top that up. So I think, so just to summarize there, I think, I think there's, I think there's enough evidence for people to, to consider doing that, that training low, especially if it's like a, a sleep low and trying to avoid carbohydrates before your training session combined with moderate intensity is probably going to be a, a, a good approach to augment some of your, your self signaling um there um i think the most of the recommendations would be that if you're going to do high intensity you want to be having a good uh, having your carb having your muscle glycogen stores full before you do that training and i think the other thing i would say that it's it's pretty hard doing a train low session is that your high intensity, we don't know exactly how long your high intensity performance might be compromised, but I, I think you, you probably need more than 24 hours before you can get, do the best quality high intensity training after a train low session. So there's a time frame associated with how long the, how long the negative impact is actually going to last. Um, I'm going to kind of speak up from the back for the people that are in the back of the room yelling and screaming to you know, <laughs> avoid, you know, avoid bonk sessions and low carbohydrate training and things like that, because I think we'd be remiss not to mention that there can be negative consequences that can outstrip any of the training adaptations that you could potentially enhance with low carbohydrate training. There's a lot of, there's a lot of re good research coming out of, out of Australia having to do with iron metabolism and bone metabolism that would suggest that doing some of these low carbohydrate sessions might negatively impact that. And so it might be, a, you know, you're robbing a physiological Peter to pay another physiological Paul when you're kind of seeking these adaptations personally, and the, the listeners of this podcast will kind of, will recognize this. It's you, it's usually a training strategy that I leave on the table. Like I don't, I, I, I don't typically use that type of intervention because I know that there are other low hanging fruit. If you'll excuse that pun, there are other low hanging fruit to kind of gather within the whole training paradigm. And it's just something beca because of that equivocal nature of it that you mentioned earlier that exists in a lot of uh, other fashions. I just tend to leave it alone. And I think it's a really good comment. And I think the couple of things is that most, I, well, I haven't seen really anything on elite athletes. So when these, you know, these studies are moderate amounts of training, you know, it's not people doing 10, 20 hours of, of training a week. So they're already accumulating all that, that stress from the other training. And I agree with you. I think, um, you know, whenever we've done these studies at the end of it, the participants have never come back and said, is it, can we extend this study because we're having so much fun you know, doing, the, <laughs> doing this training? You know, we've done, we did it for three, we did a three week where it was a, like a twice a day training study. And yeah, 
they're absolutely cooked by the by the end of it. So it's really stressful physiologically and and psychologically. And I, I agree in a hundred percent in that. And I think it relates to the whole, you know, in general, probably of the whole supplement field. In that, you know, whenever people sort of talk to me about supplements, my first question is, "Well, what's your training look like?" I, I'm pretty confident that your training's not perfect at the moment. You know. I would be trying to optimize your training first when you think, okay, this is spot on. I can't really get this any better. That's when you can maybe think of supplements. That's when you can maybe think of, you know, train low approaches and, and things like that. If you're reaching a, pl a plateau, but I think, you know, getting the training prescription and your programming and periodization, right. That would be my, that would be my, my starting point. 100%. And we, we talk about that a lot. When we start to supplement should supplement, right? They shouldn't be the cornerstone or the foundation of a training program. Training should be the cornerstone and the foundation of a, of a training program. And I think, you know, back to the, you know, also with the, the carbohydrate stuff is I, I think if there's anything that, that's re, that there is really good evidence is that you don't want to be an energy deficit when you're training. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's, you know, if I, I mean, I'm not a nutritionist, but I think, you know, most nutritionists, like that's the first, that's your starting point. Like, are you getting the enough sufficient calories to, to support the training process? And if, um, you know, if that, uh, you know, some sort of different sort of carb train low strategy is going to get you into a calorie deficit, I'd be, I think exactly what you said there. I think the the negative effects of that are going to probably outweigh any potential benefits of um, this increased cell signaling during those sessions. Well, and the energy availability piece is hard enough to do. Just especially when you have really high training volumes, you talk about athletes that are doing 15, 20, maybe even 25 hours a week, which is pretty common in iron distance triathlon and in ultra marathon running and things like that just simply getting that basic equation correct over many months is uh is is difficult in and of itself and then if you wanted to add the nuance of having some sort of even a periodized carbohydrate approach not you know not to mention having low carbohydrate sessions it just throws another degree of complexity in where really where I take it from as a coach is I first and foremost try not to screw it up and I always feel yeah. that if I do this, I'm going to screw it up. And so I kind of like leave it on the table. That's literally where I'm coming at it from is that I don't want to screw it up for first and foremost. <laughs> um, um, okay. You mentioned sodium bicarbonate. We're going to take a hard pivot here. You mentioned sodium bicarbonate at the very beginning. This has kind of come back into vogue from one perspective that you can use uh, carbohydrate or sodium bicarbonate, and that's to improve endurance performance. There's another aspect of it where you can actually use it, potentially use it to, as we were just talking about, take the training or amplify the training adaptations that you are getting out of a particular session. But since the first is a little bit more topical, we'll tackle that. And the reason that it's topical for the, uh, for the, for the uninformed is that there's a new sodium bicarbonate product out in the, out in the marketplace that purports to get around some of the traditional uh, issues with sodium bicarbonate supplementation in order to improve performance. And that's in the, in the main issue with that, David, as you're aware, is just GI distress. I used sodium bicarbonate when I was a very mediocre athlete in college running the 800 and the 1500 meters is a very good use application for that. We'd put some in a, in a little, you know, in a glass or in our water bottles, we chug it right before the race, 30 minutes before the race or whatever. And we go out there and, and probably had some sort of uh, AQ performance, uh, improvement because of that. <clears throat> and Martin's new product where they encapsulate the sodium bicarbonate within their hydrogel apparently, or allegedly can reduce the amount of GI, uh, GI distress coming into the system. We probably won't talk about that a lot, but what's the, what is the, so that the listeners can kind of understand what's the fundamental proposition of using sodium bicarbonate to improve either workout or specific race performance. And then we can kind of backtrack that into, is this even applicable in an ultra marathon situation? Yes. So I think, you know, 
fundamentally the so and this is another great sort of terminology one but let's just for simplicity say lactic acid so what we're talking about there is the lactate plus the the hydrogen ion which is the 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 acidic part of that the 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 lactate and the hydrogen ions so i'll say lactic acid just to keep it simple there but like a, like most things in the body they move down concentration gradients so you know you think about um I don't know, if it's you know if it's um cold outside and we're in winter here in australia you know you open the door the, the hot air moves from the from a hot place to a cold place and same in your body things move from where there's a high concentration to a low concentration so what you're doing with sodium bicarbonate is you eventually after it'll get into your bloodstream and it's going to lower the acidity of your blood and what that does is that creates a stronger concentration gradient so think of it almost like a i guess a sink for want of a better word but that will help to pull the hydrogen ions out of the muscle and into the bloodstream and then they combine with the bicarbonate and then you'll breathe it off as as carbon dioxide and then that'll that'll keep going so fundamentally i guess the sodium bicarbonate is trying to it should speed up the removal of the acid that you're producing during high intensity exercise speed up the removal into the blood and um, trying to reduce the decrease in muscle ph that's going to happen with high intensity exercise like you said especially with sort of middle you know a few minutes of exercise of 18 if people running 800 1500 meters i worked with kayakers they were the same like a couple of minutes two or three minutes of uh really hard exercise there's pretty good evidence that if you do that you can increase the anaerobic contribution to exercise and and improve that sort of high intensity performance and you know with an 800 or 1500 meter maybe you know reduce it by a second or two the you know the actual the actual um performance time i needed much more than that by the way i need more, <laughs> more way more than a second or way more than a second or two so if the application here is in high intensity exercise where there has the potential to for the muscle to be in a very acidic environment is there a potential performance application for sodium bicarbonate in a lower intensity exercise? Because this is the zillion dollar question with the, in, the endurance community as a, as a whole, is if we're competing at moderate or lower intensities, is this a worth is, is this a worthwhile supplement to potentially improve performance? For those of you not watching the YouTube uh, version of it, David's uh forehead just started wrinkling up when I asked that question. <laughs> so apparently there's a great deal of consternation going on in the back of your head right now. <laughs> yeah, I think that like a lot of these things, I think the evidence is pretty is solid for the high intensity. There's, I would, and I have to be honest, I haven't looked at this literature for a while, but when I was looking at it, the bulk of the literature wasn't really supporting, you know, endurance performance and that's not even getting into to ultra endurance performance if i was going to clutch at straws i guess the only benefit would be you know sometimes with these um different i'm, I'm thinking more like like cycling like we kind of yeah. you know like a, a long tour where you think and i'm not that familiar with ultra endurance running to be honest but we kind of think of it as you know low to moderate intensity but you do have sort of like breakaways and things like that where you need to do yeah. to do a sprint and so i'm not really sure if that happens in in ultra endurance whether every now and again there's a you do have to do like a, a high intensity effort but i would say you know for for low intensity exercise of a few hours I haven't seen any good evidence that the, that sodium bicarbonate would benefit that type of performance. Right, can I increase your consternation a little bit with my theory? Yeah, yeah, sure, go for it. You can you can entertain this. So we we do see athletes that use these protocols in low intensity situations, and 
they have the sensation that their performance is being improved by that. And whether that's placebo effect or the real biological mm. effect or a combination of those two, who knows? And we've, we've observed this, we meaning me and my coaching staff, we've observed this even going back to the transdermal uh, lotions, uh, the transdermal delivery systems for sodium bicarbonate. I've had the sneaking suspicion that in those cases, it has something to do with the amount of sodium that's actually being ingested and not the bicarbonate piece of it. Because it, in, in, in many of these applications, it is a lot of sodium, like on the equivalent of when you're doing a sodium loading protocol and a hyperhydration protocol, it would be the equivalent of that. That's my, uh, conspiracy theory. <laughs> On, yeah. on why on why we're observing some of these important performance improvements at lower intensities is it's not necessarily the buffering capacity or the sink, the sink effect as you as you termed it that it has more to do with some something to do with the copious amounts of sodium that's being ingested. That's a, it's a really good point to be honest, and I've never thought about that. And maybe that's why. Yeah, I think again, like I haven't really I haven't looked at the literature for a while, but. Most of the endurance performance was probably, you know, was more that mid range. So where the, the sodium is less likely to, to have effects. So I, I, there may be something out there. So I haven't seen a scientific study where you're looking at three, four, I don't know exactly how long all of these, are, you know, let's say four plus hours yeah, four plus. of exercise where, where the sodium could be a, a limiting factor. So I think, that's interesting. And I think the, um, that's where, you know, different, um, yeah, different supplements could have a beneficial effect, but for a, for a completely different reason. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred. And, and we see that a lot within the supplement industry. It's originally intended for this, but then years down the line, we see that it also has an effect on some other process and then it gets you know, there, there's either another permutation of it or a bastardization, if you, depending upon what side of the fence you look at it on, um, of that supplement into another, uh, into another use case. Um, I think it's interesting as well in that, yeah, sometimes, um, yeah, one of the criticism has been of the sodium bicarbonate literature for high intensity exercise where, where people go, well, how do you know it's not the sodium that's having the, yeah. Yeah. the beneficial beneficial effect and so people have also used um other you can you can change the the blood buffering with substances that don't you know don't contain sodium and still seeing the same effects i think the sodium has been i think largely ruled out as explaining the benefits of sodium bicarbonate on high intensity exercise but yeah i think it'd be interesting to for some researchers to look at that whether there is a beneficial effect of supplying sodium on these ultra endurance performances. Yeah. Like I said, that's been my sneaking suspicion because it somehow changes the plasma volume. And that's so important in these long duration types of activities where there's in, even in hot weather types of conditions, but I digress. We'll move away from that because that's, we're getting to way too much speculation. So one, one of the things that we can at least reduce the amount of speculation on related to sodium bicarbonate as well is its potential to enhance adaptations from a particular training session. And this is another area that you've got a great degree of familiarity with. I want you to kind of walk, th walk the listeners through how that actually happens because it's an interesting uh, biochemical kind of cascade that we're looking at in terms of the signaling mechanisms and how sodium bicarbonate can actually take the work that you're doing and make it more impactful. Yeah. I think I won't, I won't digress too much, but I think this is one of those, I guess, you know, kind of happy accidents that we'd, um, we were looking at sodium bicarbonate during training. And for some reason, I can't even remember the, I think we just want to do something a little bit different. And so we did measure, we were, we'd done a lot of studies looking at repeated sprint training. And just for this particular study, we decided, okay, we've done enough repeated sprint. Let's have a look at a, let's have a, an endurance performance test. And it ended up being probably the most interesting result from the, from the study. And, but fundamentally what we did is, and these were, you know, you talk, you know, your, your 
athletes and maybe some of these listers are, are you know, elite athletes. But so these are university students, they were uh, females, but we had them doing exactly the same amount of training and the same intensity, they were training side by side. But what we did is we gave one half of them sodium bicarbonate, so your classic sort of dose, 60 to 90 minutes before they did the training session. So we didn't say, you know, we've just been talking about the acute effects. We didn't say, okay, if you can train, maybe the sodium bicarbonate will allow you to train harder. We kept them training at exactly the same intensity, volume, duration, etc. And what we saw is that both groups improved their endurance performance, but the group that took sodium bicarbonate had a greater improvement in their endurance performance. They both had the same improvement in VO2 max, but the group that took sodium bicarbonate had a greater improvement in their lactate threshold. So that got us thinking that it must have been a, a sort of a muscular adaptation. I think I said at the beginning, I went to France and so we had an opportunity to do the same kind of experiment with, um, we, we did an animal experiment, so with rats. And same cool thing, like the rats are on the treadmill at exactly the same time, exactly same speed, but we gave one, of, one group of rats and we put the sodium bicarbonate directly into their stomach with a, with a gavage before their training sessions. And we saw that the rats that took sodium bicarbonate had a greater improvement in their mitochondrial respiration as well. So that kind of linked the, the muscle adaptations. We've also done some other studies like uh, just a single exercise session where actually Marty Gabala did this nice study where they gave sodium bicarbonate and they saw greater increase in a marker of mitochondrial biogenesis. And we did the opposite where we gave people an acid and made their blood a little bit more acidic before they did exercise. And we saw a dampening of the, the, the markers of mitochondrial biogenesis. So we've kind of formed this hypothesis that if you, when you're doing high intensity exercise, if you can reduce the, the buildup of um, acid in, so the decrease in pH in the muscle, that maybe we can augment the, the adaptations to training. And so I think we've got a reasonably consistent story. There has been a couple of others. There's a study out of Australia where they did a short-term study with um, well-trained rowers and they didn't see a, a, a beneficial effect of the, the sodium bicarbonate. My, I think it may be to do with the training status. They also did, it was a short term, it was only a few weeks and they did a lower intensity of high intensity, like we did quite a high intensity interval training. So I think there's, you know, I, you know we're talking about how confident we can be in some of these things, but I think it's something that it's, um, definitely worth considering and only with um with high intensity um high, high intensity interval training sessions i i think it's something that yeah is worth considering whether that might be a way to try and in improve the the, the mitochondrial adaptations to a training to a high intensity training here's here's how i really look at this is i i look at training interventions partially through the lens of kind of hedging bets. And what I mean by that is, is if, if you can use a very specific intervention that has multiple advantages, it's better than using a training intervention that's focused on like one kind of narrow thing. And so here you have a, a, a supplement intervention that you would use that has two potential advantages. First, and you ruled this out in the first study that you mentioned, which was an ISO work study, and I, I really appreciated that design. <clears throat> but the first advantage is it could just improve the performance during the workout. Take sodium bicarbonate for a work during a workout, particularly a high intensity workout. You could potentially have a higher quality workout that therefore would hopefully cascade into a more robust adaptation. Now you add on to it the fact that the sodium bicarbonate itself, even in an ISO work situation, so even if the workout is the, is the same or the quality isn't improved for whatever reason, that supplement might augment or enhance the adaptations that you're naturally going to get out of that workout or series of workouts. I kind of view that 
as you're hedging your bets, you're going to get the improvement or an enhanced improvement one way or the other, either facilitated through a higher quality workout and or facilitate facilitated through just the ingestion of the supplement itself. That That's when I start to get interested, right? When I start to see the multiple effects, this kind of like multiple effects that could even potentially compound on each other. It, that That's really kind of my threshold, so to speak, as to whether, as to look at something as an interesting intervention to actually par partake in. And this is one that actually does have that. And I think the flip side too, is that, you know, I haven't, you know, there, I haven't seen anything to say that there'll be a negative effect of this type of training. So, I, you know, even like I said, the, the, the study in rowers that was published a few years ago, I think there was a slight trend, but they they definitely didn't see like a worse effect yeah. on um, on the training. So I think yeah, it's not particularly expensive sodium bicarbonate, and you know the, the worst case scenario I think is that there's there's you're getting your regular benefits from the high intensity training, and you're not getting any additional benefits from the from the sodium bicarbonate. Yeah, it's it's cheap if you go buy baking soda, but if you buy the Martin product, <laughs> you're looking at like I think it's like like five or seven bucks us us bucks uh per per dose per per time that you're going to use it so that makes an expensive workout session which is fine for some people you're olympic level athlete that's what you want to pay for they're great but if not you you know you can go buy baking soda off the shelf for pretty cheap i think in the other option and i don't know what the options are in the in the us and i'm not 100 sure what the purpose is but where we did these studies we didn't we didn't do the you know the spoonful of baking soda and water because that's yeah, it's like drinking chalky it's, water. So yeah, it's it's, bad. it's pretty nasty. It's, it's pretty nasty. It's but we would we would get um, you can even before this company that you mentioned, we would buy um, sodium sodium bicarbonate tablets from a pharmacy, and um, so the pharmaceutical grade, and they're maybe not exactly the um, you know the, what special slow release formula yeah, they've got yeah, here yeah, but yeah, yeah. but they, so we we would give and there's quite a lot like you'd have to take 20 or 30 tablets depending on how much you you weighed but that my memory and you know i've got inflation going around the world so you know maybe i'm thinking of the good old days and i'm getting my prices wrong but my memory was like yeah you know, a few dollars for a, an actual container with a couple of hundred um tablets in it so i, I think there are there probably are cheaper options out there yeah, I totally agree. I was more making fun of the dichotomy of putting sodium bicarbonate in a, uh, in a glass or in a, in a in a bottle, which is once again what we used to do before all of this, versus having more high tech interventions. Um, David, this is really fun. We're gonna let you go. Um, I, I I really appreciate the conversation. We hit on a lot of different things. Um, I, I can just say from a coaching standpoint, you've contributed so greatly to our understanding of a lot of these biological processes. So my thanks goes out to you and the teams that you've worked with over the years at improving our knowledge in terms of how we can use training interventions and what's going on underneath athlete hoods, so to speak, from a biochemical standpoint with their mitochondria and also how we can uh, enhance those adaptations. I am going to link up any specific uh, studies uh, that we discussed in the show notes, but where can listeners find out more about you and some of the research and the work that you're doing. Yeah, I think um, I was going to say Twitter. I think it's X now, isn't it? But um, everybody's making that transition and it's hard. <laughs> but um, it, I haven't been as active as um, uh, as lately as I, as I used to be. And I probably do need to. But so I have uh, my Twitter handle is at Blue Spot Science. And so I normally put my latest studies, not just my research, but other research that I come across that's that's you know that's interesting by and large it will be exercise prescription and or sort of mitochondrial um, type stuff so they can link on there I think there's probably a link to my publications um, there as well so they can track down the publications awesome I will put links to that in the show notes as well I uh, appreciate you coming on the podcast today I've really enjoyed it. Thanks to you, Jason. Thanks, mate. See ya.
All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Professor David Bishop for coming on the podcast today. I've always appreciated his approach and the knowledge that he brings to the table to inform us on how mitochondrial adaptations actually occur, when they occur, to what extent, the different nuances of specifically how different intensities improve mitochondrial function and mass differently. This whole thing, it was something that I originally started my coaching journey with. It was a big part of what I focused on early in my coaching career. It's always nice to bring it full circle with an expert such as David to help enlighten me and the audience even further. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends, your training partners, your coach, anybody that you might think has an interest in this stuff. Links will be in the show notes to all the research papers that we discussed. If you want a deeper dive, please go check out those show notes. They are great and tremendous resources if you want to expand your knowledge base even further. All right, folks, that is it for today. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.